Okay, so this video is going to look at the information on posture that we're going to be discussing in this class. So um, I do want to give a heads up. I did change, I did swap out the file that was on Blackboard with the notes for this. I, I noticed for some reason on the one that, that was posted, there was some stuff missing off of the slides. So I just wanted to make sure that you, you had the most updated one. So if you have the old one, uh, go in, you know, if you, if you did happen to print them all out as they were all kind of in the folder to start with, just make sure to go back and get the updated one. If you didn't, it's not a huge deal. You can just write some stuff down even while I'm discussing this. So this is just going to look at some of the important points in regards to posture. And then we'll, we'll hopefully try to apply some stuff with exercise to show how we can create some, how we can uh, correct some postural issues. So when you're looking at posture, so there's obviously static and dynamic posture. And for now, we're just going to focus on looking at static posture and then get into some of the, the muscles and things of that nature that we want to look at. So from an anterior view, when you're kind of looking at the person, you know, these are some of the structures of note that you kind of want to look at if you're kind of evaluating the person as far as uh, where where these anatomical marks should be. So look at the earlobes, the shoulders, uh, the iliac crest, the patella, and the medial malleoli. These are all of the different areas that should line up when you're looking at the person from an anterior view, okay? So now again, you could get as sophisticated with this as you want. Some people have grids that people stand next to. Some people actually do use a plumb line, which is basically just a string drop from a ceiling with a weight on the end and kind of look at people to see where some of these different um, anatomical marks sort of line up. So these are the ones you want to kind of note when you're looking at an anterior view. Okay, from a lateral view, okay, you want to kind of look at the, the plumb line or kind of what would drop um, on the, the, the lateral side of the individual. So you start up at the external auditory meatus. That should line up with the, with the earlobe through the center of the shoulder, so directly bisecting the deltoid uh, through the center of the greater trochanter. Behind, so it'll go be, it'll go through the center of the greater trochanter, but it actually aligns behind the actual hip joint itself. So it'll split the greater trochanter, but be behind the hip joint. It'll also fall behind the patella and then anterior to the lateral malleolus. Okay. Now again, if you don't have a plumb line, again, just kind of you know you're just kind of eyeballing these these anatomical landmarks to make sure. And again, we're going to go through some postural distortion syndromes and some things that you can look for that would, would create problems. And then here you just have the, the, the posterior alignment. So again, note the earlobes, the shoulders, the scapula. Now, when you look at the shoulders, um, it, it's not uncommon to see the shoulders not quite be totally even. Um, the the non-dominant shoulder tends to sit a, a little higher. So in other words, if someone's right-handed, their right shoulder does tend to dip um, a little bit more than the left shoulder. It does tend to be held a little lower. Um, so again, obviously that, that might affect the scapula as well. But again, primarily with the scapula, what you're looking for too see if there's any winging of the scapula, seeing if the medial border of the scapula is very prominent. Um, you know, you could also look at some other postural issues with the scapula. The hips, the PSIS, or the posterior superior iliac spine, you want to make sure that they line up. The, the knee creases and then the, the medial malleoli. Okay, so those are the, the, the posterior landmarks that you kind of want to look at and, and see where they fall. Okay, so if you look here, we have our common postural abnormalities. Again, sometimes it's a good idea to use the more, more common scenarios as a starting point. It's not to say that, you know, because they have something or because a certain muscle's tight, you know, it needs, it needs to be addressed a certain way, but at least it's a starting point you could look at. And in most cases, this is what you're usually going to see. So we have in the, the, the slide here, we have a picture of what's called the lower cross syndrome and the upper cross syndrome. So right here on this part on the left, 
you have your lower cross syndrome. So what's going on in both of these situations is something called reciprocal inhibition. Now, reciprocal inhibition is not by itself a bad thing, okay? So in other words, if you have to forcefully flex your hip, okay, for, for one reason or another, a sport, running, whatever it is you're doing, if you forcefully flex your hip, obviously the hip flexors have to contract very, very powerfully in order to do that. In order for that to happen functionally, the hip extensors have to relax. So if you're, you're forcefully flexing your hip, your hip extensors have to relax. So that's a normal thing that has to happen with the nervous system. However, if due to some type of postural issue, you end up creating a situation where a muscle becomes overactive at rest, it's also in turn going to make a mu another muscle group weak and it's going to inhibit it. So when we're looking at the lower cross syndrome, you see in this situation, you have a tight iliopsoas, which is actually gonna pull down on the pelvis. So it's gonna pull down this way. You have a tight erector spinae, which is gonna pull up. So think about what that's gonna do to the pelvis. If you have a tight erector spinae pulling up, tight iliopsoas pulling down, it's going to cause the pelvis to tilt anteriorly. In turn, because these muscles are tight and overactive at rest, it's gonna cause the glute maximus, which as we know is a hip extensor. So the hip flexors are tight and overactive. It's gonna cause the hip extensors to become weak and inhibited. The erector spinae, which is going to extend the torso, extend the spine, is tight and overactive. It's gonna cause the abdominals, which cause flexion to be weakened. So without getting too in-depth into it, and, and you have to be still thinking critically and, and going through an assessment of everybody whenever you're gonna work on them in this manner, but you would essentially mobilize these tight structures and strengthen the weak structures. And hopefully by doing that, you correct this anterior pelvic tilt, okay? So that's the lower cross syndrome. If we come over here, we have the upper cross syndrome. Same idea, okay? If we look at the weakened inhibited muscles, you have the weakened deep neck flexors. So if you think of the deep neck flexors, if you, you know, just sitting there, you, you know, you kind of sit up, you mind your posture and you kind of do the chin tuck, you retract your, um, you know, you kind of pull your, your chin in, do the chin tuck. That, those are your deep neck flexors working. Okay, they tend to be weakened in this in this situation, and also the scapular stabilizers, the retractors and the depressors. Okay, so the, the scapular retractors and depressors, so particularly the middle and lower trap muscles, along with the rhomboids. Okay, those muscles tend to be weakened. I would also throw, even though it's not a retractor. Um, the serratus anterior as well. Now we know the serratus anterior does protraction, but it's still a scapular stabilizer. So again, those muscles tend to be weakened and inhibited. Muscles that tend to be overactive, the upper trap and the levator scap tend to be overactive. And then the pectoral muscle group, and I would even put very commonly the latissimus dorsi also tends to be overactive. So what that ends up producing is kind of that rounded shoulder forward head posture, okay? So again, you think of different ways to correct that. We're looking to kind of bring the neck back into um, you know, upper cervical flexion. And you're, you're looking to create a situation where you get the scapula to retract. So when you look at what goes on with the neck here, there's actually two things. Notice I said upper, um, upper cervical flexion because what's essentially happening here so when you have that forward head posture you tend to put the lower cervical spine into flexion and the upper cervical spine into extension so think about that for a minute okay so you're looking at this person here with the forward head posture the lower part of the cervical spine is flexed but the upper part is actually extended so that's why we're working on the deep neck flexors here when you go and do the chin tuck. So if you think of kind of like, you know, poking your head forward as if you really were over exaggerating this posture and pulling back, what you're doing to correct that is you're, you're, you're actually flexing the upper cervical spine, but you're extending the lower cervical, okay? So it, again, think about that for a little bit, actually do it yourself. You can kind of feel what's going on with your cervical spine as you do that, but, but these are some of the more common postural abnormalities that you would see.
Okay, here are some other things. Again, um, here what we have on the left here, you have what's called pronation distortion syndrome. So these are individuals who tend to hyperpronate when they walk. If you look here, you could kind of see the, the bowing of the Achilles. That's a very common thing to see with these individuals. You can see a, a flattening of the uh, medial longitudinal arch. The other thing you will see is what's called the too many toes sign. So if you look from behind and you can see in this person, okay, they're actually a little worse on this side, at least from what I can see. But um, if you can see particularly all four lateral toes from behind, it's called the too many toes sign. So that's usually a, a indicative of the fact that they have this pronation distortion syndrome. There's some muscle imbalances there that you would see within the, uh, the lower leg. We look on this other side over here. This is called flat back posture. Okay, so this is it's not very common. You'll see this sometimes in individuals with sometimes with acute back injuries because they, they kind of go into spasm in that region. There's also uh, an increased risk of some stress on the discs because you've flattened out the lumbar spine and put it in a flexed posture. So again, not, not quite as common. The, lumbar, the, the lordotic posture tends to be much more common to see, but, but flat back posture can certainly be an issue. Now here's a list. So, uh, and this is from the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Um, the, the corrective exercise specialty certification goes over this. So this is a list of muscles that tend to be overactive and tight, okay? Now, notice we're saying overactive and tight doesn't necessarily mean strong. So sometimes people confuse thinking that, well, the muscle's just really strong and it's overactive. In some cases, that could be true, but not always, okay? Sometimes a muscle reflexively becomes tight because of the fact that it's so weak, it actually goes into spasm. So these are the groups of muscles that would typically be tight. So your gastroc soleus, your adductors, your hamstrings, the psoas, the tensor fasciolata, the rectus femoris, the piriformis, the QL or the quadratus lumborum, the erector spinae, uh, both uh, pec muscles, the pec major and pec minor, the lats, uh, the teres major, which I'm noticing as I'm looking at this slide, teres major spelled wrong, um, the upper trap, the levator scap, sternocleidomastoid, and the scalene muscles. So these are muscles that are tending to be tight and overactive um, in an individual. And then if we have the muscles that are tight and overactive, we also have the muscles that tend to be underactive. So these are the muscles that tend to be understimulated, some of which we talked about already. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the muscles in the lower leg. Um, the pronation distortion syndrome, the tib anterior and tib posterior um, tend to be very underactive. Um, they, they don't support the arch the way they're meant to, and those individuals tend to a lot of times have a very tight gastroc soleus. Um, some other muscles that tend to be underactive, the, the VMO, uh, the glute max, glute med, we already talked about the glute max, the glute med also becomes underactive as well. Uh, a lot of individuals tend to overcompensate uh, their hip abduction, they tend to use more uh, TFL to abduct their hip instead of the, the glute med. And you can see that a lot of times if you put a person sideline, um, they sometimes have a tendency to wanna to flex their hip a little bit before they abduct. And that's usually because they're trying to recruit their TFL in order to do that. Uh, transverse abdominis, the internal oblique. So you can see some of the abdominal muscles tend to be underactive. The multifidus, which is that, that deep segmental low back muscle um, typically tended to be used a little bit more as a proprioceptor uh, for the low back. The serratus anterior, middle and lower trap rhomboids, um, your rotator cuff muscles, and your deep cervical flexors. So this is a, a, just a general overview as far as posture is concerned. Um, so take a look at this information again. Again, look at some of the muscles involved. If you look at a muscle on here and you don't remember what it does, by all means, go back and review your, your muscle function.